and welcome to Connect the World. I'm Linda Kincaid, filling in for my colleague Becky Anderson. We are tracking two stories out of Egypt for you this hour. We start with breaking news out of Egypt where two trains have collided. The Ministry of Health tells CNN at least 32 people have been killed, dozens more injured. Now, this happened in Egypt's Shoha government region earlier on Friday. Now, the railway authority says the accident was caused by someone pulling an emergency brake. Now, Egypt's poor railway system is notorious for collisions as well as other accidents. Uh, ben Wiedemann is following the developments from Cairo and joins us now. Uh, certainly horrific pictures we're seeing that are coming into us, Ben. Just bring us up to speed with what we know. Yeah, this was a train, Linda, that was headed from Luxor to Alexandria, really one of the busiest train lines here in Egypt. And, of course, it's Friday, the weekend, so we can fairly well assume that that tra train was full at 11.42 local time. That's about five hours and 19 minutes ago. Uh, somebody, according to the Egyptian government, pulled the emergency brake and caused this train to stop and another train slammed it into it from behind from the pictures we've seen several of the train wagons passenger train wagons were thrown off the uh, the tracks and there are lots of injuries now the latest is at least 32 dead we just heard that at least 91 injured as well now the prime minister and the president of egypt have both said that whoever was responsible will be punished obviously uh and uh, but yes as you mentioned egypt has the egyptian rail system has a long history of accidents some of them horrific even worse than this one in fact but uh, yes this obviously adds to the headaches of and and heartbreak of this country that's already dealing with this problem in the suez canal Linda? Yeah, it certainly is. And Ben, I, I would like you to stick around for us if you can to discuss that story uh, in just a moment. Thanks, Ben Wiedemann there. Uh, that is the, the other big story that we are following out of Egypt, the blockage, of course, in the Suez Canal. Now, the owner of the giant container ship blocking the canal says it might be free and floating again this weekend. Now, that's rather an optimistic outlook since one salvage company says the Ever Given is stuck rock solid. It has been blocking the canal since Tuesday when it ran aground, bringing one of the world's busiest waterways to a screeching halt. Now, it's no small task dislodging uh, this massive vessel. More than 15,000 cubic meters of sand have to be removed to get it out. Giant machines have been working around the clock to move the sand and the mud. And, and take a look at this satellite photo that we've got dozens of ships that were in the canal when the Ever Given got stuck and now in a nearby lake just waiting while well, other shippers are taking other routes which adds time and of course money to every shipment we are covering this story from every angle john deterius is following the story for us from abu dhabi and our ben wiedemann of course is joining us from cairo uh, john i, I want to ask you about this backlog because there are hundreds of uh, ships obviously waiting to get through and there's the desire to, to make this happen quickly just bring us up to speed with what the canal authority is saying with regards to progress well they're clearly trying to turn the tide here after a very slow start in the first two days of this operation uh, the Suez Canal Authority actually giving some guidance that it has this target uh, to reach up to 20,000 cubic meters of sand and mud to dredge out in a short period of time and they're already suggesting they're at 87 percent there uh, I find it's right but they're being very cautious uh, suggesting no timeline at this uh, stage of the game and you talked about the hundreds of ships uh, in fact the list is growing longer Linda the latest update we have is from 10 a.m. this morning uh, it crossed well over 200 to 239 and the data collection group and analysis group Refinitiv was suggesting uh, we're starting to see another hundred arrive by the end of business on Sunday if this is not solved. You talked about ships that are rerouting. We see this in the early stages right now. Uh, we have a count of both container and energy vessels, uh, 11 going eastbound and westbound, even if it's going to take them longer to go around the, the Cape of Good Hope in Africa into Europe and the United States. They're going to be cutting their losses, they think, by uh, taking action 
right now. And what is global commerce? What does this artery actually mean? We try to put this in real numbers to give a sense of the value of the goods that are passing through. According to Lloyd's List, that's $10 billion a day going through the Suez Canal alone. If you break that down per hour, the value of the goods passing through, $400 million per hour. So this would have uh, an incredible impact in terms of commerce. Uh, people keep on asking me or texting me around the world and saying, what's the influence on growth? Nothing dramatic yet because we're four days into it. If it spills into the second and third week, it's a completely different game. And that's what the Suez Canal Authority is trying to avoid by stepping up the dredging here. Yeah, certainly uh, incredible figures you're throwing at us. Uh, 400, uh, I think you said $10 billion. In terms of what we are seeing, I want to go to Ben Wiedemann for, for a bit more on the ramifications of all of this. Because as we've discussed, this, this shipping route is responsible for 10 to 12 percent of global trade. Just bring us up to speed with what's happening there in terms of the ramifications we're going to see if this drags on not just for days but potentially weeks. Well, if we're talking about Egypt, uh, they get about $5.6 billion a year. They did last year at least uh, in revenues from the Suez Canal. It's a very important sort of prestige project for the Egyptians. And it's, it really puts Egypt on the map in terms of global trade and therefore there's a lot at stake here a lot at stake if you also take into account the fact that with the shrinking polar ice cap uh, that uh, there are new routes that are being looked at as a way to avoid going through the Suez Canal altogether also keeping in mind that you know the Egyptians have spent a lot of money in the last few years trying to upgrade and expand the Suez Canal. But, and this is quite a task because we're seeing that ships are getting bigger and bigger. The Ever Given, of course, is one of the largest container ships on Earth. Since 1956, the width of the Suez Canal has been doubled, but as we see, even that isn't enough to avoid this kind of very expensive and frankly embarrassing problem. It certainly is embarrassing, uh, Ben Wiedemann. I want to go back to, to John Defterius because as far as we understand it, high winds played a role in causing this incident. Uh, does Mother Nature have a potential role in the effort to free it? You know, that's what the shipping industry is hoping for, uh, Linda. But let's cover off this single source of, of the challenge for the uh, ever given. Uh, the, the, was it really the uh, veracity of the sandstorms that caused the problem? There's a huge debate in, inside the community that I'm listening to uh, saying that it seems almost impossible not to have another feature involved, uh, a faulty uh, device or something or with an engine uh, challenges. But that's left to the community. It's not been determined. There's still an investigation taking place. Uh, now, regards to Mother Nature's role this weekend, uh, I've had two shipping ex executives tell me in the last uh, 24 hours, look at the tide reports. And I said, OK, what are you talking about? And they said it's high tide, a seasonal high tide on Sunday, the 28th in the Suez Canal. I'm not going to say this is going to be the problem solver. It can be the uh, the assistance uh, for all that dredging that comes through. It'll be the best chance for them to refloat uh, the vessel, according to the sources I, I'm speaking to. But we're getting some very mixed signals, and you mentioned this in your lead-in right now. We have the Japanese uh, ship owner uh, suggesting they hope it's going to be refloated on Saturday evening. That seems like in a very accelerated timeline. And then one of the Dutch salvage companies, the CEO, who's been pretty dour, very straightforward over the last uh, 48 hours, says, and this is a quote, he says that he thinks that that ship is stuck uh, like rock solid, uh, that's not going anywhere fast, even though we see the dredging numbers uh, going up. So it's pretty impressive what we're seeing in terms of the progress right now, Linda, but it's a split decision whether this is going to happen over the weekend or not. And right now the canal authority is just not willing to give uh, any guidance whatsoever. So um, it's interesting what we're seeing now with some of the ships leaving the area at, at the same time, uh, not wanting to get stuck in this challenge uh, because of the backlog that we see at both entrances.